Good morning. Happy New Year. Raise your hand if you are tired this morning. And keep that hand raised. So everybody look around, and these are the people that you need to hit on the back of their head when you start hearing them snore. All right, all right. You can put, put your hands down. Now, I know many of you probably had late nights or really early mornings, maybe. I, I heard there was like a 5 a.m. Uh, time out, out there. You, you guys are crazy. But all right, so even though some of us might, might be tired, I do not want you to miss what God might have in store for you or for the person that, that, that's around you. And so we'll dive into God's word, word, word together, and, and we'll see what he has for us on this first day of 2017. How many of you, when you're writing dates, you know, it's going to take you about three months before you get the 17 down? Yeah, that, that, that will be me. So, all right, if you have your Bible, I want you to open up to Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1, and we're going to be looking at verses 29 through 34 this morning in Mark chapter 1. So because it is the new year, that means, very sadly for me, even though some of you it might be a good thing or you might not care, it means that Christmas is over. And, and, and that's sad for me. You know, I, 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 could, I could have the Christmas decorations up all, all year. You, you know me, I, I love Christmas. But, you know, when it comes to Christmas, is it that everything builds up to Christmas? Because especially when we get towards the end of the year, it seems like everything is building up for Christmas. And that's how some people, you know, all year long, they're just waiting for Christmas to come. Everything builds up for it. Um, and when we think of what Christmas is about with Jesus coming, the coming of the Messiah, it seems that for a lot of Jews, it was all of life was waiting for, everything was leading to that point when the Messiah would come. And that's what they were hoping for. And that's what everything was building up towards. So is it that all things lead up to Christmas or is it that Christmas is actually the beginning of all new things? It is, isn't it? So it's not like all things, lead, even though, yes, all history led up to the point when Jesus come, but when Jesus came to, to, to this world, it changed everything. So it's not like Christmas is the end of all things. Christmas is really the beginning of all things. You know, that, those tiny hands in the manger, that wasn't the end of the story. In fact, that was in a lot, in a lot of ways the beginning of of the story, or, or maybe that was the end of the beginning to where now everything that, that God had intended could finally come about. Because those tiny hands in the manger, they, they didn't stay tiny, did they? No, they, they grew because Jesus was 100% human, just as we are 100% human. Yes, he's also 100% God, and, and that can be hard to wrap our minds around that, but, but yes, he is 100% God, but he is also 100, he is also 100% human, which means that he grew up just as we grew up, which means he had probably the common cold, as we all, as we all get. Uh, I'm sure he had the various sicknesses uh, that, that were there at the time. I'm sure he ran and tripped and skinned his knee and um, and uh, I'm sure he experienced, you know, walking for the first time and, and learning how, how to talk. Now, wouldn't that be interesting, being, you know, Mary and Joseph and thinking, all right, this little bundle of ours, this is God, and we get to teach God how to talk? You know, how weird is, it? How weird is that? Of course, I don't know if Mary and Joseph fully understood everything that, then and there, but, but Jesus grew up because he came for a purpose, and he lived his life for a purpose. And so we're going to be following Jesus in his life and thinking about those hands, those hands that were so tiny, tiny in the manger, now grew to be hands that would perform so many different actions and, and do so many different things to his life that ultimately would take him to, to the cross. But we're not going to jump to the cross yet. We're going to follow him throughout his life. And so if you're there in Mark chapter 1, we're going to start with what's one of the first miracles. It's not the first miracle that Jesus does, but it is one of the, one of the first ones. Um, because when, when Mark starts off, you know, Mark, unlike Matthew and Luke, Mark doesn't refer to Jesus being born. He doesn't talk about the, the, the Christmas events. He jumps right into John the Baptist's 
preaching and, and announcing uh, that, that the Messiah is, is coming. And, and right away, he, he gets to Jesus as an adult very quickly. Jesus is, uh, goes into the wilderness where Satan, where Satan tempts him, and, and Jesus resists those temptations. And then when Jesus comes out from that, tem, uh, that period of temptation, he goes to, um, he goes to the synagogue with, with some of his disciples. And that's where, when we look at some of the other Gospels, he announces what his ministry is for. But while he's there at the synagogue, he happens to uh, encounter a man who is possessed by a demon. And what do you think Jesus does with that demon? He casts he cast him out. And the people that are there when Jesus is there at the synagogue, they're amazed at Jesus. Not only because he cast this demon out, which... I'm sure would be, would be the sight to see, but also because of what happened before, his teaching. They had never heard one who taught with such authority. And so they were captivated by his teaching. And then added to that, at the end of the, at the, end of the service, Jesus is then casting out demons. And they're like, who is this man? We, who, who could he possibly be? And so, and so people, as they're going home, as, as, as good people do, they, they, they talk. You know, that's what we like to do. We, we like to talk. And so, and so news spread very quickly. But it's that same day, after he leaves the synagogue, then he is, Jesus is going with uh, some of his new disciples, and he's going to a house to spend the night. Now, this is the Sabbath, the day that they worshiped. And this is where we're going to be picking up here in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 29, and our scripture reads this. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went into Simon and Andrew's house with James and John. Simon's mother-in-law was lying in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he went to her, took her by the hand, and raised her up. The fever left her, and she began to serve them. When evening came after the sun had set, they began bringing to him all those who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. The whole town was assembled at the door, and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and drove out many demons. But he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. May God bless the reading of his word. So this morning as we're looking at Jesus, I want us to look at his hands as healing hands as healing hands. So we've heard, I, I kind of told us what was going on before being at the synagogue. So after they come, after they leave the synagogue, they go to Peter's house. And by the way, um, um, you know, Andrew is Peter's brother and, and James and John, they're, they're there as well. And then we get to the Peter's house. They inform them that Peter's mother-in-law, because Peter is married, that she's sick and she's in bed with a fever. And in the book of Luke, and by the way, does anybody know what Luke did as a profession? He was a doctor. And so throughout, throughout Luke, he often describes things as doctors would. And, and Luke calls it a great fever, which to us doesn't sound very technical. But at that time, uh, it was a very technical term, that this wasn't just a little tiny fever that she had, or it wasn't that she was just under the weather. Uh, she had a very serious fever, and so, and so she, she was in, in bed. And so when, when they get there, and, uh, and when uh, Peter, uh, mother-in-law, is sick, it says here in Mark that immediately they go to Jesus and they tell him, What's up with, with Peter's mother-in-law? That she's sick, that she's in bed with this great fever. Now, why would they tell Jesus that? Well, maybe it's because, um, you know, it was part of the culture at the time that the women were the one who did the serving. So maybe they told Jesus because, all right, you're not going to get your normal service because uh, mother-in-law is sick. But I really don't think that that's what it was. Because in one of the other Gospels, it was either Matthew or Luke, um, it says that they asked Jesus... To help. Now, it doesn't specifically at, at any point say that they asked him to heal her, but I think that's what's implied, because they know that they don't fully know who Jesus is yet, but they do know that he is one who has authority from God, and he is one who has already done some miracles. Like I said, this is not the first miracle he's done. After all, he just cast out that demon in the synagogue, and the very first miracle that he did was at the wedding banquet when he turned the water 
you know, into wine. And so he has performed a, a few miracles before, so they know that he's one with power, and he's, he's no, he, they know that he's one that can possibly help. And so they go immediately, and they ask Jesus if he could help. And so what does Jesus do? He goes to Peter's mother-in-law, and he takes her by the hand. Now that's significant because I know you might not realize this, but Jesus is a man, and Peter's mother-in-law is a woman. And why is that significant? Because a man did not take a hold of a hand of someone who he was not related to, of someone who is not his wife, not his mother, not, not his daughter. It was just culturally something that, that, that you didn't do. But all throughout Jesus' life, we see that he was one who didn't care what culture said. He was one who loved every person, no matter how important or how little they seemed in the eyes of society. In fact, it speaks volumes that one of his first miracles is directed towards a woman. Because back in, in, in the culture of the day, women were considered second citizens. You know, the men were the important ones, especially the rich ones or the religious leaders. But that Jesus would go to a woman and not a wealthy one and not anyone of high esteem, but, you know, just an ordinary average woman, that Jesus would go and do one of his first miracles with her speaks volumes that Jesus came for everyone, that Jesus came for everyone. So he takes her by the hand And by the way, not only is that socially unacceptable, but religiously that was unacceptable as well. Because uh, if, if you touched a woman that you were unfamiliar with, there's a possibility as a Jew that she would be unclean, and in touching her, you would be unclean as well, which meant that you couldn't go to the temple to worship until you went through all the ritual washing. And so men avoided contact with women. Like I said, unless it was, um, unless it was a, a, a close relative, unless it was, it was their wife. But again, Jesus isn't concerned about social norms. He's not, considered, he's not uh, worried about religious norms. So he goes, he takes her by the hand, he raises her up, and he heals her at once, completely, quickly. Now, this is also something that's a little bit odd, because what day is this? It's the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the day that they worshiped. And when you go through the Gospels, you'll see that Jesus is going to run into uh, a lot of confrontation with those religious leaders, especially when he gets in this bad habit of healing people on the Sabbath, because we shouldn't want that. We shouldn't want people to get healed on, on God's day. That seems ridiculous. Actually, it seems to make perfect sense, but, but the religious leaders at the day considered that work, and you don't do work on the Sabbath. Now, Jesus, he's not out in public do, you know, doing this, but he's still at home, and does, and, and does he look at Peter and say, well, you know, I'm sorry your mother-in-law is sick. After the sun goes down, that's when their Sabbath is over. After the sun goes down, then I'll heal her. Is that what Jesus did? No. He was concerned about here is a woman who is suffering in need, and I can do something about it right here and right now. And so he goes, he touches her, he raises her up without any concern of social or religious uh, 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 taboos, and he heals her. And his healing is so effective and so quickly that she gets up and starts, and starts serving. Now, how many of you, when you, as soon as your fever breaks, you feel like just doing everything at once? It still takes a while for your energy to come back. It still takes a while for you to feel back to normal. But this is how complete and how, and, and how quickly that uh, Jesus' healing touch was, that she felt good to go. She was firing on, 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 all, all, on all engines. And so at once she started serving Jesus by, by getting the meal ready, by serving him and also the, the other disciples there. But I think also what when when Mark and Matthew and Luke, when they record this miracle, when they mention that she gets up and starts serving Jesus, I think they're also hinting at more than just serving as a good hostess, doing, uh, showing hospitality. I think it's also an indication that she starts serving Jesus with her life. Um, because, you know, as Jesus ministered throughout his life, not only was he accompanied by those disciples who liked to bicker and fight, but he was also accompanied by those faithful women, uh, those women who followed Jesus, who served him, in fact, when Jesus was at the cross, 
other than John, where were the other disciples? In hiding. But what about the women? They were right there with him. And so that, that touch on her hand when he raised her up, I think completely transformed her life. And so when we look at, at, this, at, when we look at this, this story, I want us to first see a hand in the home. Because Jesus' hand was in this home. As he healed and as he showed compassion, as he raised up. And as we think of Jesus' hand being in the home of, of Peter's house, healing his mother-in-law, what about your home? Is Jesus, is his hand in your home? You know, when the service was over, Peter took Jesus to his home. How many times do we come to church and we hear about Jesus, we worship Jesus, and when church is over with, we go home, but we leave Jesus at church? Maybe we need to be taking Jesus into our home. Sometimes a lot of the trouble we have at home would simply go away if we brought Jesus home with us. But so often we don't do that. We just leave Jesus at church or we leave Jesus other places. But when we step through that doorway, it's like Jesus doesn't exist here. Or we forget that that he should exist here. You know, when Jesus is in your home, though, don't have him just sit there idly. I mean, when Jesus came into Peter's home, uh, did uh, and Peter knew of this need that he had in his home, did he say, well, I don't want to bother Jesus with it. You know, I'll just let him be at rest and, and just kind of enjoy him. No, what did P- Peter went to him with the needs and with the burdens that was in, in his household. And so if Jesus is in your home, don't let him sit just idly there. We have needs and we have burdens. And, and Jesus is with us to help us, to give us life, to give us life that is full and life that is everlasting. And he's with us to help us through the trials and through the sufferings that, that we go through. So when Jesus is in our home, don't let him just sit there idly. Share your burdens with him. Share your heart. Tell him what's going on. Jesus, I need your help with this. This is going on in my life. Jesus, you know the brokenness that's in our family. Because understand this, Jesus' hands are, are not so weak that he cannot hold your burdens. A lot of people think, well, I don't want to bother him. When in Scripture do you ever see God saying, you know, don't bother me, go away? Nowhere. And so that mentality, well, I don't want to bother God. I don't want to ask an- another thing. That is wrong in and of itself. That, that, that's of the devil because it says this, God, I either don't need your help or I don't want your help. Or I feel like I'm not good enough or important enough for you to help me. After all, remember who Jesus helped. Someone that society would say wasn't worth his attention. But yet Jesus saw her as worth all of his attention, just as he views you and your home as worthy of his, of, of his attention. So his hands are not so weak that he cannot hold our burdens. And his hands are not so unloving that he is not willing to help and to touch our family, and to bring healing. So when, he's in, when you bring him into your home, let his hands minister and let his hands help. And when Jesus does touch your life and touch your family, well, what should our response be? What was it that Peter's mother-in-law started doing right away? She started serving him. And by the way, that should be a great response for any of us, that when Jesus is involved in our lives and involved in our house, that we should start getting busy serving him. But how often is it that we go to Jesus with a need, with, with a cry from our heart, Jesus, this is going on, I need your help, and when he comes to help, all right, thanks, and I'll leave you there until I need you again. Is that the way we should live, or should we instead, out of, thank, out of thankfulness, serve him and worship him and honor him? You know, when Jesus sent his disciples out to uh, to, to travel through various towns and to come across various households. He gave them this instruction in Luke chapter 10, verses 3 through 7. He said, Now go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Don't carry a money bag, traveling bag, or sandals. Don't greet anyone along the road. Whatever you, house you enter, first say peace to this household. And then if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. But if not, it will return to you. Remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they offer, for the worker is worthy of his wages. 
Don't be moving from house to house. So basically what Jesus is saying is when you go to these towns, pick a house, go up to it, and with that greeting, peace be you. What he says, if a son of peace is there, basically if they welcome you into their home, then go in and eat what they offer and, and, and stay there. But if you go to a house and they reject you, don't force your way in then move on and find another house. And if they don't happen to find any houses within a town, as we'll see in a second, then they just move, move on to, to another town. And that's important because Jesus never forces his way into your home. Just as he never forced the disciples to go into a home. Jesus never forces his way into your heart. In the book of Revelation, it talks about how Jesus, he says, look, behold, I'm standing at the door, what? Knocking. He doesn't just burst in. Now, Brian and Carol, they're fine if you just burst into their home. You know, I grew up in a, in a city, Albuquerque, and so that was just weird for me. And it still is kind, kind of weird. So, but, so, but I've got to the point that if I go, I know it's perfectly fine. In fact, they like it. Where, you know, they don't want you to knock. They just won't want you to go in. And why? Because they are welcoming. Because I, 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 because I know that of them. But Jesus, he's not... He's not going to just force his way into your home unless, unless you welcome him in. And unless you just live a life that says, Jesus, you're welcome any time. Just, just, just come on in. But sadly, so many of us sometimes in our lives, we do close our heart and we close our lives because of whatever reason. Because, well, I don't want Jesus to interfere with this part of my life or I don't really want to give up control of my finances or my friends or my relationships or whatever to Jesus. And so we close our heart. And so then Jesus, then all he can do is just knock. Let me in. Let me in. I can help. I can help with your griefs. I can help with your burdens. Let me in because I, I long to be with you because I love you. Just let me in. But he will never force his way in. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you would do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you serve him would surely be the best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched and welcome to our heavenly visitor? Or would you maybe change your clothes before you let him in? Or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you turn off the television and hope he hadn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered that last loud and hasty word? Would you hide your worldly music and put some worship music out? Could you let Jesus walk right in, or would you rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would your life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep up its usual pace? And would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read? And let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed. Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans for a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends? Or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or with a sigh and great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus came in person to spend some time with you. And I do wonder if Jesus were to walk physically in our church, in our homes, what would we do differently? Would we just welcome him in or say, ooh, maybe now is not the best time, Jesus? Because God wants to pour out blessings on your home and on your life. So will you let him in? But not only do we see a hand in the home, we also see a hand in the community. For after Jesus healed uh, Peter's mother-in-law, when the sun set, which remember for the Jews meant their Sabbath was over, then all the town came flooding to Jesus, came to this house where Jesus was staying. And why did they come there? Well, who did they bring? Those who were sick 
and those who were demon-possessed. Now, why would they bring people who were demon-possessed to Jesus? Hmm, maybe because they had just seen or heard that he had cast out a demon in the synagogue. You see, news quickly spread. So why didn't they come during the day? Well, because it was the Sabbath, you don't work on the Sabbath. And the Jews had put all these rules on the Sabbath. Like, if you took uh, X number of steps, I don't remember off the top of my mind how many it was, but if you took too many steps and that was work, and then you, were in, you violated the Sabbath. And so, you know, and so you didn't want to travel too far. And then if they went to Jesus during the day, he wouldn't heal them anyways because healing is work and Jesus wouldn't violate the Sabbath by actually healing someone on God's day. That, that, that's just ridiculous. So they waited for the sun to set. And when the sun set, they came flocking to the house. And when Jesus saw all the town coming, bringing those who were sick, bringing those who were demon-possessed, what did Jesus do? Oh, I'm tired, go away. Now's not the best time. Come back tomorrow after I've had a good rest, after I've ate a good meal. Is that what he did? No. Right away, he started healing, and he started casting out, out demons. In fact, in the book of Luke, it says that he laid his hand on each one. Now, did Jesus, does Jesus have to touch a person to heal them? No. In fact, in the book of, I think, Matthew, um, between the synagogue and in this encounter at, at Peter's house, it, it mentions a centurion whose, uh, I think, servant was sick and uh, asked Jesus to heal and even said, Jesus, you don't have to come to heal. You just say the word and, and they'll be healed. And Jesus was amazed at his faith. And so that shows that Jesus doesn't have to touch anyone to heal him, but here he chose to touch each person. He, as Luke said, he laid his hand on each one, each one who was sick, each one who was demon-possessed. So why did he place his hand on each one? I think it was because Jesus wanted to establish that personal connection to each person. Because sometimes when there's just a crowd, you just feel like you're just part of the crowd. You know, you're no one special. But Jesus wanted to make sure that every person who came to him knew that Jesus noticed them and Jesus loved them. And what this tells me is that Jesus doesn't overlook anyone. He doesn't overlook you. Sometimes you might, I don't know, you might feel like that you're no one special. You might feel like people around you are more worthy than you. Um, But Jesus looks at you. He created you and he loves you dearly. And so Jesus is willing to put his hand on your life just as he placed his hand on each one that came. And so Jesus first met the need in the home and then he used that home to meet the needs in the community around it. Now that was that community, but what about our community? Is Jesus' hand in our community? Does our community need Jesus' hand? Are there needs? Are there sickness? Are there, um, are, are there addictions? Is there brokenness in our community? Yes. Does our community need Jesus? Yes, most definitely yes. There are so many needs in our community. There, there are physical needs of people with, with sickness or with hunger or uh, with, with abuse and with addiction. There are spiritual needs, again, with, with addiction, with lostness, with, uh, with uh, just uh, strongholds of darkness that are, that are in our community. And only Jesus' hands are power enough to meet every physical need in spiritual need. His hands, only his hands can do it. No one else's can. And this I know about Jesus. Now let me ask you this question. Do you think Jesus wants to meet the needs in our community? Because after all, Jesus came to heal the broken, to raise up the lame, to give sight to the blind, to give hearing to the deaf, and ultimately to give life to those who are dead and to bring salvation to those who, who are lost. Jesus wants to, bring, to, to meet the needs of our community. In fact, I believe firmly that he plans to meet the needs that are in our community. But perhaps, just maybe, his plan might be to meet the needs in your house first. Because maybe his plan to meet the needs in our community is to use your house and your home to do it. And maybe my home. Maybe all of our homes together. Maybe that's his plan. I'm going to meet the needs that are in Bethel Springs. I'm going to meet the needs that are in Selmer. I'm going to meet the needs in McNary County. But I'm going to do it through the homes of my people. 
So, maybe we need Jesus to work in our homes so He can work in our community. And maybe we don't see Him doing as much as we would desire Him to do in our community, as much as we know He wants to do in our community. Maybe the, the, the addictions and maybe the, the lostness and the brokenness, maybe it just seems just to continue and continue and continue on because we're not letting Jesus into our homes and into our lives. Because maybe He just wants to use us to meet the needs that are around us. Again, when Jesus gave the instructions to his disciples to go from town to town, he continued with the instructions, and in Luke chapter 10, verses 8 through 12, he, he told them this When you enter any town and they welcome you, eat the things set before you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. When you enter any town and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, We are wiping off as a witness against you, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet. Know this for certain, the kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, on that day, it will be more tolerable for Sodom than for that town. You know, the kingdom of God is near. And the question for our community is, will our community find the kingdom of God or will it miss it altogether? Will our community turn to Jesus and find salvation, find healing from brokenness and addictions and and, and darkness? Will it be a community that experiences revival? A community that sets not only the surrounding area on fire, but maybe that sets our state on fire, that sets our nation on fire. Maybe God is waiting to bring revival to our nation because He first wants to start it in McNary County, Tennessee. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? For God to move His hand in our community, to move His hand through our nation. But maybe His hand again is just waiting on us. So is God working through your home to heal and to bless the community around you? Is your home a blessing to the community around you? Does your home... Add to the brokenness and the darkness to the community around you? Or does your home fight to push back darkness? Does your home fight to see lives saved? To, heal, to see marriages healed? To see children thrive? Is your home a force for God or is your home just a force for the world around it? Because God's blessing in your home is meant to be a blessing to the community. Because when God pours out His blessing, God always intends for His blessings to overflow. Which means that when He wants to pour blessings out to your life, it's not just for your benefit. It should be the benefit for the lives that are around you. And when God pours out His blessings on your home, it shouldn't just be for your home's benefit. It should be for the benefit of the community. When God pours out His blessing on this church, it's not just for us to enjoy His blessing. It's intended to be a blessing for those that are around us. So God wants to pour out a blessing on on your home, on your life, on our church. Do we let Him? And do we become a blessing for those that are around us? Because Jesus' hand is ready to be involved in our home. His hand is ready to be involved in our community. And lastly, I want you to see a hand in salvation. A hand in salvation. For if you look back at verse 31, it mentions that when Jesus took Peter's mother-in-law by the hand, he did something to her. What was the very next thing that he did? He raised her up. And that word is the same exact word, that word used to raise her up, is the same exact word that is used throughout the Gospels for resurrection. I think perhaps that Mark and Matthew and Luke, that they are hinting and that they are foreshadowing that what Jesus is doing 
This is just a hint of what's to come. Because Jesus not only has the power to raise a woman sick with fever up, but he has the power to raise the dead back to life. Because Jesus' hand heals and raises us up so we can live eternally for him. That's why Jesus came, not just to cure fevers, but to cure sickness and death for, for, for all time. His hand has the power to raise us back to life. In fact, in the book of Matthew, Matthew mentions uh, this miracle, and he ends it a little bit differently than Mark and Luke. In fact, let's look to see what Matthew says. When evening came, they brought to him many who were demon-possessed. He drove out the spirits with the word and healed all who were sick, so that what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah might be, f- might be fulfilled. He himself took our weakness and carried our diseases. So here in this passage that we see, we see that Jesus did take the sickness from people and healed them. But again, I think that's just foreshadowing. It's hinting what Jesus' ultimate purpose is because ultimately Jesus didn't come just to heal us of fevers, just to heal us of sicknesses. Jesus ultimately didn't come just to cast demons out of our lives, even though he did all those things. But Jesus was beginning to reverse the effects of, of something that was going, why do people get sick? Why is there sickness in the world? Why do demons and the forces of hell interfere with lives all over the world? Why is there those who are possessed by demons? Why does it happen? It's because of one little word, little word that starts with an S and ends with an N. And I'm not talking about sun. I'm talking about sin. Sin brought brokenness to this world. Sin brought sickness to this world. Somebody asked, why do people have to die? Why do people get cancer? The answer is sin. We chose to reject God's perfect plan. And because of sin, there's brokenness in this world. Why is Satan at work in this world? Because of sin. And Jesus came to undo that. And here at the very beginning, he's starting to undo some of the effects of sin by healing and by casting out demons. But it's hinting, it's foreshadowing. Again, as Matthew said, he takes our burdens. He took our weaknesses. Because that is also talking about ultimately when he came, he took our burden of sin by dying on the cross to give us life. Because the moment that he died on the cross and was raised again, sickness and death and hell were defeated. You see, Jesus' hand gives life. In Psalm 103, verse, verses 1 through 5, the psalmist recognized this and he said, My soul praise Yahweh, and all that is within me praise his holy name. My soul praise the Lord and do not forget all of his benefits. He forgives all your sin. Notice that word, that small little word there. It doesn't say he forgives most of your sin. It doesn't say he forgives the small sins. It says he forgives what? All your sin. He heals all your diseases. He redeems your life from the pit. He crowns you with faithful love and compassion. He satisfies you with goodness. Your youth is renewed like the eagle. Who would not desire that? But once again, God will not force it on anyone. His hand is standing ready to come into your life, to come into your home, and in so doing, to come into our community. His hand of salvation stands ready. So will we let His hand come? Mark Bruner, who is a fellow minister. He told a story that happened at his house once where a tiny finch was flying and came and crashed against his window. Obviously, with the reflection, thought that it saw the forest, saw that it saw the trees, but unfortunately, it was, it was the pane of glass. And when he went out after he heard that, that thump against his window, he saw the finch laying there on the ground, and he saw that it was still breathing, so obviously it hadn't died. 
Maybe it had noticed right before it hit the window something wasn't quite right, and so instead of hitting it head on, which would have snapped its neck, maybe at the last moment, obviously it, it, it tried to turn, but not quick enough because it still hit and, and, and fell to the ground. So when he saw it there, it was a, a bitterly cold winter day. Um, he saw that it was breathing, but it wasn't moving. And so he scooped it up in his hands to provide some warmth while, while it recovered. And he said, slowly it, it did. First, the eyes started moving around. And he said, I, I couldn't imagine what it would feel like for this little tiny finch to be in the hands of the giant staring into, you know, these big old eyes, you know, just, just staring at it. Um, and after its eyes started moving, then its head started moving. And then it started struggling against these hands that were providing warmth and against these hands that were pro- providing protection. And so he thought, all right, it must be recovered enough. So he gently set it on a branch where one of its feet grasped tightly, but the other one still wasn't moving well, and so it fell to the ground again. And so he scooped it back up because it, was, it, you know, it wasn't much older than a baby, obviously and old enough to fly, but there in the bitter cold, he, he knew that it would probably just freeze to death if, if it wasn't able to get to its shelter. And so he held it again, and, and this time its legs were kicking against the hand, wanting to get freedom from these hands. And when that didn't work, it thought it would peck its way free. And so it started pecking against, you know, against its fingers, desperately doing anything to get out of these hands that it just thought was a threat uh, to, to its very life, a threat to its security. Well, eventually it did recover enough to where he could set it and set it free and he mentioned that when he finally placed it and it it did securely stand on on that limb he said as i watched that little bird climb higher and higher into that tree i was suddenly struck by his misplaced fears if it had not been for my hand and my attentiveness to its well-being perhaps that little bird would be lying in a frozen heap right now in the middle of our deck As much as my hand had provided security, even a life-giving warmth that it probably could not have found anywhere else, the finch would have nothing to do with it. He wanted out no matter how irrational or painful the consequences might have been. His fear of me entitled him to nothing more than a great risk of death, not the comfort of freedom and long life it was certainly seeking. And then he said, and then I thought about us in God's hands. You know, so often we think that God is just a hindrance to our life. That God's hands is just moves to limit our freedom, to limit our security, to tell us to do this or not to do this. And we struggle and we fight against these hands that all they're doing is providing warmth and life and security and hope for eternal life to come. And so I guess I want to end this way this morning. If you've been fighting against God's hand in your life, then you're fighting against the hands that bring life and hope. So stop fighting and surrender to the hands of Christ. If you need, if there's brokenness in your life, then let Jesus' hand come and bring healing. If there's brokenness in your home, let Jesus come and bring healing. Because there is brokenness in our community. And we cannot afford to hinder what God wants to do in the lives around us. So will we surrender to His loving hands this morning? Let's pray. Father God, we come before You this morning. Father, we recognize that we have a new year ahead of us. But God, the truth is, none of us know how long or short that we have here in this world. But God, we do know this, that every moment that we draw breath is a moment for you to work in our life and through our life to those that are around us. So God, I pray that every breath that we breathe would be a breath that praises and glorifies you. God, every action that we take would would be an action that follows you and glorifies you. So that, God, you can work in us and through us to bring life and salvation and healing and hope to the community that's around us. But, God, I recognize that some of us here this morning need your hand to work in our lives. God, there are some people here that 
are battling depression. There are some people here that are battling broken relationships. There are some people here that are sick with worries and stress. God, and we need to recognize that your hand is good. And God, for we need to invite you to come in to our lives and to our homes, to bring your healing touch, to raise up what is dead, so that you can work through us in the community around us. So God, as we are coming to a time where we respond to you and to your word, God, I pray that none of us would turn your hand away. I pray that none of us would just let you sit idly in our lives doing nothing. But God, all of us would open our hearts and our homes to you to see your hand at work and to see the wondrous things that you will do. Jesus, thank you for being powerful and loving enough to save. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.